Tonight we're continuing the second chapter of Ephesians. <coughs> You'll notice as we progress through this uh, book, this, this spiritual potency continues to elevate. It, it is uh, elevating in chapter 2. We're getting higher and higher. And it's going to continue in chapter 3, chapter 4. And then we'll have some practical teaching at that point. But the reason uh, Paul is able to do this, to deal with such profound matters that are so extensive, is owing that he laid a good foundation uh, to build on. You can't build deep thoughts on shallow foundations. And when people's emphasis, the main things they talk about, are not profound, they really can't teach you anything that is profound. Yeah. This, is, this is the way it really is. So shallow preaching is based on shallow foundations. That's why it's shallow. You can't preach shallowly, Lee, if that is a word. You can't preach in a shallow manner when you've got a firm foundation. And I take it that this, this is how I see it, that shallow preaching means the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. It's just stated in kind of a <laughs> vulgar way. But I was once in that category myself. Thank God I got out of it. Something about it I didn't, I knew it wasn't right. That, that God talked in baby talk, I knew that, that can't be. Because when Jesus started talking, the mind started working. Yeah. We're going to be in chapter 2, verse 13, and the first part of 14. Now, Paul, he's established the reason for the saints in Ephesus being in Christ. You do want to think about this from time to time, why you're in Christ. Why are you in Christ? Now, he's done so from the highest possible vantage point. He takes you back before the foundation of the world. He maintains that God chose us. I don't, I don't want anyone to try and mi mitigate or neutralize or minimize that statement. Amen. Amen. That's a Holy Ghost statement. Yeah. Amen. He chose us in Christ before the world began. And he tells you that this wasn't because like he foresaw what we were going to do. This, he affirms, is because he predestinated us to be adopted children. That's a pretty solid foundation. I don't know about telling you. That's a, that's a sound foundation. It's so, it's so solid a lot of people can't receive this. See, because they, they're accustomed when they go to the pool to be at the waiting end all the time. And this isn't at the waiting end here. The reason it isn't is because to be stable, you've got to be on something that's stable, Amen. see? So it wasn't a result of God's foresight. It was a result of God's predetermined choice. That will lay at the root. Now, that we, we don't understand it. I acknowledge to you all the, all the whys and wherefores have not been revealed. But the fact has, and we rejoice in the fact that we will not let anybody take it from us. By divine intention, you're saved by divine intention. If God did not intend to save you, you would not have been saved. Amen. The fact that you have been means God intended for it to be so. Amen. See, well, I, don't, I can't see that well, and you be praying for, pray that the eyes of your understanding be open, because this is the way it is. This is what he said. He made us accepted in the Beloved. He didn't give us an opportunity to be accepted in the Beloved. He made us accepted in the Beloved. See, I'm showing you here that God's been 
Paul's been telling the Ephesians why they've been saved. The divine working accounts for the redemption that we have through his blood. And was in order that the riches of his grace might be known to other people that are higher up in location and aptitude than we are. See, God wanted somebody with more than normal intelligence to understand what he's doing. So he didn't first do it so the people on earth would understand. They're frankly too low. It's not fitting. This work is so great, it's not fitting for it to be done just so people here on earth could understand. That's not enough. So he does it so principalities and powers and heavenly places might know his wisdom. Now that, that gives more incentive to God than when lowly creatures like men say they see a little bit just like the border. This doesn't mean a whole lot to God. I say that with some degree of caution. What I'm saying is that he wants more. This thing is targeted for more than that. So actually, he's just he's tuning us up in salvation. He's tuning us up down here, so we'll know we'll be able to kind of get in on the intelligentsia up here when we get there. Now these affirmations he's made. They're not like creedal statements. They're not things that he reveals so people could argue about them and debate about them. The thing that people want to come to the point where they know they're participating in these decisions God said he made. God said he made some decisions. He determined, he chose, he made. Now, do you, you want to know whether you're in on that or not. Yep. That's, that's why Paul's telling us to the Ephesians. He's telling them, not because this is like something we print in a track and hand out to everybody. It's not like that. It's that he saw in the Ephesians firsthand and then heard it by report that they had faith in Christ and love to the brethren. He said, ah, these, are, these are some of the people. These are some of the people, so now I'm going to tell them why they're in the condition they're in. in Christ, that, that's what this epistle is about. Isn't that a good consideration? <laughs> All right, our text is Ephesians 2, 13, and the first part of 14. But now in Christ Jesus... Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition. Now, at this point, we're going to get into some... I don't know that uh, deep is necessarily the word, although it is very deep. There's some profound distinctions that I didn't see when I was younger. I didn't hear anybody talking about this when I was younger. And I think that's why it took me a while to kind of grow up. I was about, about 24 before the light kind of began to really dawn. On, I just saw glimmers up until then. They, and even the glimmers seemed like I was out way out there ahead of the other people. I, and I, but even then, I was kind of in the in the glimmer, <laughs> glimmer state. I think back at it, it's almost it's almost humorous. I was just seen looking like this squint eyed, and it seemed like I was ahead of everybody <laughs> ahead of everybody else. It was all new stuff to them. That's the way I was raised. The only man I really had fellowship with in the truth was my father. When I say that, that is what I mean. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for it. See, God put him in my path. Mm -hmm. yeah, put me in his path. <laughs> because it was a relief to him. Mm -hmm. We never discussed a matter of scripture on which we were disagreed. Mm -hmm. And now I'm talking about a period of about 40 years. Maybe we hadn't, maybe... Whoever was doing the testifying, him or myself, the other one didn't know it at the time. Mm -hmm. 
But as soon as we said it, the other one saw it. Why? This foundation, this is the secret. Being on this foundation we're talking about. Neither one of us, it wasn't foreign stuff to us that God chose us and God predestinated us and God made us accept it. This was not foreign to us. It just wasn't crystal clear to us. But once you settle in your mind that this is the way it is and you're not trying to figure out is this really what it means and did God really do that and you get past that stage, then when you experience this, as soon as a, someone in Christ speaks out a truth that maybe you never heard before, you see it because it's on, yeah. it's on that foundation, yeah. see. Amen. Now in Christ Jesus. What's, that's a, I like that phrase just right there. We can see, spend a lot of time right there. But now, in Christ Jesus. As some other versions read, by Jesus the Messiah. Here's a New Living Translation. Now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Living Bible says you belong to Jesus Christ. Williams Bible says through your union with Jesus Christ. The Message Bible says because Christ of Christ dying that death, shedding that blood. Now I'm going to tell you right up front that most of those versions are wrong. They don't say what this verse is saying. And thankfully it upsets me that Bibles like this are in circulation that leave wrong impressions. Now this is a technical point I'm going to make, but it is the point that Paul is making. <coughs> Some versions are more an interpretation than they are a translation. Like lit, united with Christ, belonging to Christ, union with Christ, and because of Christ dying. Now all of those facts are true, but they are not what this text is saying. In Christ, that's not what that means. We do have union with him, we understand. Now in Christ Jesus, here's the idea here. Jesus himself is the environment. That's the point he's making. In Christ means that's the room where all the work's done. That's the place where all the benefits are received, see? Amen. That's the area in Christ where eyes are opened up and where grace is received and where growth is achieved. Jesus himself is the environment. So in, in Christ is exactly what it means. In Christ. In other words, we've become a part of Christ. Well, of course, we're his body. <laughs> That's a part of Christ, isn't it? Is Christ and his body separate? Is your head and body separate? <laughs> you got a real problem if someone takes off your head. <laughs> That's the end of you. See, we've been made part of Christ by being put in Christ. In him, like a branch in the vine. That in him like a branch on the, in a tree. We're in him. In Christ Jesus. Now God himself put us in Christ. How else could you get there? Christ is in heaven. You're on earth. Christ is glorified. You're not glorified. Christ is immortal. <laughs> You're mortal. How could you be in Christ if God didn't put you there? But he did put you there. Not figuratively, really. He says there's a part of you that's not there. But of him, that is of God, are ye in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.30 states. This was accomplished, the if you want to look at it from a timeline, this was accomplished and you were baptized into Christ. <laughs> into Christ. You see our text says we're in Christ. Into Christ. I haven't come from a group that emphasized being baptized into Christ. None of these people ever really meant into Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, right. that's not what they meant. Mm -hmm. In fact, they didn't have it. They just glossed over that. 
they went down into water and thought it was into Christ. I'm telling you the truth now. Is what they thought, but it wasn't. That's not what into, into Christ means. Into Christ. The time it happened is when you were baptized. That's when, it, that's when God did it. But God puts you in Christ. And we'll deal briefly with the fact that Christ is in you too, see. At that time, you were, as Acts 4, 14 says, you were added to the Lord. All right, that's the express statement of Acts 5.14. You were added to the Lord. Not added like a, an appendage. Mm -hmm. Added as to put in to Christ. You become a part of him. That's why where, whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. That's why. Because the people are in Christ. See, it all fits together, doesn't it, marvelously? Yeah. The expression in Christ, as it's used in this text, as Christ as an environment, is used 65 times in Romans through 1 Peter. This, like, is a key, key teaching in Scripture. Speaking of Jesus as the environment in which those who live have been located, it's mentioned at least 14 times specifically. John particularly emphasizes dwelling in him or abiding in him. See, that's the same thing. <laughs> God puts you in Christ. Your mission, stay there. Amen. Huh? Yeah. What happens when a person who was legitimately added to the Lord falls away? They did not abide in him. That's what it is. You can't, that's what it is. That's the cause. That's the cause. Because outside this environment, nothing that God requires of you can be done. Outside of the environment of Christ, you get out, nothing that God has to give you can be received. That's the way it is. Outside of this environment, you can't see like you ought to see. You can't work like you ought to work. You can't hear like you ought to hear. This is why some two people sitting here the same things. One person rejoices in it. The next person scoffs at it. What's the difference? One ends, one out. One is out. Amen. That's the difference. Thus, by speaking of being in Christ is understood to carry the connotation of abiding in him. It's not once in, always in. Yeah. God puts you in, now the word is abide. Jesus said, abide in me. Amen. Stay here. Yeah. Stay where you are. Now, it's a unique, this is a unique expression and experience. Both the statement and the concept of being in Christ is absolutely unique to the new covenant. Yeah. There was never anything like this before. Noah's family were saved by him, but they weren't in Noah. Right? The Jews were delivered from Egypt because of God's recollection of Abraham, but they were not in Abraham. The Israelites were led out of Egypt by Moses, but they weren't in Moses. John the Baptist effectively paved the way for Christ, but his disciples weren't in John the Baptist. In Christ, that's a new kind of thing in God's dealings with humanity. There never was anything like this before. And yet this is vastly understated in some places, never stated. In Christ. It's such a remarkable thing, you will never come to the point when you're satisfied with your understanding of this. No matter how long you've been in Christ, this will still boggle your mind. Yeah, yeah. Now, all the resources or... We would say all the grace required to stay in him or abide is within the environment that's in right. him. That's right. Amen. See, that's why you rejoice in the Lord. You labor in the Lord. See, <laughs> it's all done in the Lord. When we come together, it's got to be in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord, because that's where everything is. Yeah. Yes, but... That's 
That's why it's so critical to pray for one another that we're not distracted. Mm -hmm. That's good. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Our attention can... In other words, before you will be turned aside, your attention yes. is turned aside. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very true. Mm -hmm. And we, we live... Has there ever been an age where there are so many distractions as this age? See, technology, swiftness of transportation, electronic media, all things have in, in increased, multiplied exponentially the number of distractions that you face. So that you couldn't get on the sidewalk and walk two blocks without having a who knows how many distractions, every one of which has the potential of luring you, luring you out. It's so like Solomon said to his son, there's the, the, the woman, the, un, the Horace woman was calling at the side of the street. There were two women, Wim, Wisdom and the Horace woman. They were both calling out. Yeah. It's still the same way now. Right. Yeah, the Lord is calling, and then there's these other distractions. See, much, uh, I hesitate to say this, but... Much of the preaching of our time is not from the perspective of being in Christ. There's a, too many references to Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Neither one of those are written with being in Christ. You say, are you saying they're without value? No. They're, they're like a kindergarten primer. But they're not without value. Don't make no mistake about it. They're in the Word of God. Yeah. But I, no apostles of them. They just very rarely appeal to them, not because they they were uninspired. They were inspired, but they were inspired at a lower, lower level. They didn't have eternity in mind. In this case, the Psalms transcend Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon because David spoke more from heaven's point of view than from earth's. I say that because you, it's, easy, it's easier for an opportunist to build his ministry on these other books than it is on being in Christ. There's too much, if you, it's possible to spend an inordinate amount of time in Moses and the prophets. It's possible to do this. Moses and the prophets did speak of a coming deliverer and some of the traits, but they did not expound them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? Because it wasn't for them. That's right. It wasn't for them. So they didn't. They talked about a new heart, mm -hmm. new spirit, writing the laws on the heart, but nobody really knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. It was never expounded. God would just say, and then you'll keep my judgments. He just it was beyond them. See beyond them. So you can speak you can spend an inordinate amount of time plowing around back there and end up losing your bearings. At some point you gotta get down to this foundation. Now, this foundation we're talking about, that was never mentioned by any of the men. Moses, the prophets, nobody mentioned this kind of foundation. Well if it was talking about election and predestination, it was, it was Israel in, in mind. See I'm showing you here that these foundations you really got to pay attention to them. And you can't get them any place but in the apostolic writings. That's the only place you can get them. Once they do, they'll open up some things. I understand that. They'll open up some things, but you don't begin back there and reason your way up there. You begin here, and then you can open up back there. The details. Receiving Christ and Christ being in us, they don't contradict each other. They set forth a, the experience within the framework of our total being, spirit, soul, and body. From our total being, from that perspective, spirit, soul, and body, that's you. You aren't just your spirit. You're the spirit, soul, and body. If you were just your spirit, God wouldn't redeem your body. So you're all three of those. All three of those are you. You are comprised of those. God's going to change all of them. He's going to make all of them new. He's made your spirit new now. 
The soul and the body is going to be made nude later. But this is all you, and from the standpoint of that, Christ is in you. <laughs> you from that viewpoint, Christ is in you. But viewed from the standpoint of the new creation, it's in Christ. Yeah. That's the distinction. That this should, now that this being in Christ should take place while we're in the body, <laughs> praise God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a marvelous thing. Who would have thought such a thing as this could happen? Mm -hmm. That while you're in the body, you could at the same time be in Christ. Yeah. But it's so. Amen. It's just so. Amen. Now this uh, being in Christ, the essential you is in Christ. As the, the recreated you is in Christ. The rest will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Whatever, right? For right now, it's, it's not in Christ. It's in the earth. Yeah, that's, right. that's why you subordinate mm -hmm. the part of you that's on earth. Because mm -hmm. quite frankly, it's calling out for attention. Yeah. Since you come into Christ, the body saying, hey, how about me? Mm -hmm. How about me? Say, well, we're gonna we're gonna deny right. the lust of the flesh. Now this reveals the circumstance of God. This is necessary in Christ, was necessary because of the holiness of God. God's holiness requires that those he accepts, they have to themselves be holy, genuinely holy, really holy. Well, if you look at the total us. That's not the case. There's a, <laughs> there's a part of us that's not. Mm -hmm. But there, there's a part of us that is. Mm -hmm. The new man is created in all righteousness and true holiness. That's the part that's in God because God can't receive anybody else. Amen. God can't receive an unholy person. Mm -hmm. That's why he has to make him holy first. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's, what, that's what happens when you're born again. You're made holy. Yeah, right. Then you put it in an environment where you can maintain the holiness. Before Christ, this requirement, being holy, was met by faith by men like Abraham. They were holy by faith. God took their faith, which connected them to the coming Christ, see, and he accepted them on the basis of their persuasion that Christ was coming. Amen. He accepted them on that basis. He accepted what they did on that basis. He imputed righteousness to them on that basis. That they had faith in the coming Christ. When the Christ came, mm -hmm. his atoning death reached back. Amen. See? Cleansed all those Amen. saints that lived by faith back there. Cleansed it. Mm -hmm. And they cleansed them. And now, now, now that justifies God accepted them. Mm -hmm. See, now in heaven, nobody has any questions about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all these saints being accepted because the, the Lamb... That did it. He's sitting there, Amen. as a lamb slain. They said, "That's why. Mm -hmm. That's why these other saints are are in, are in paradise. That's why they're there, because uh -huh. they had faith in the coming Christ." Well, yes. Then you can see that we we really are joined to the Lord. Yeah. We really are made holy. Yeah. Our sins are really put away. Mm -hmm. That's right. It, and we really are being renewed. That's yeah. right. It's just not uh, taught. It's, that's yeah. right. It's got to be this it's way. It's not a parable. Yeah. Or it's, a, it's very real. See, he's accounting for this to the Ephesians. Yeah. That God doesn't do unreal things. It's a, a real God does real things. Yeah. Not unreal things. But to these eyes and these ears, they can't they can't see that dimension. That's, yeah. that's beyond them. So it has to be declared. Now, if somebody hadn't have declared this, we'd have never struck on this. Yeah. I don't care how long you'd have been a Christian, you'd have never said, finally said, I figured, we're in Christ. You'd have never known it if this wasn't declared. Amen. And the truth of the matter is you can't persevere until you know it. Amen. Now, when Jesus entered into the, into the real substance with his own blood, he justified God. Now you've already went That's over right. this, but see, this had to happen. That's Christ right. had, God had to be justified for 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 being kind <laughs> and having Amen. for for coming close to these former brothers. Right. And Amen. so when Jesus entered in, 
and with his own blood, his own he blood. entered in. This is this was the effectiveness. Yeah. Is that it justified God for the whole the whole plan yeah. of salvation was justified. Amen. See, the heavenly personalities, the only other defection they knew about was Satan's defection, and they didn't get back in. And God wasn't kind to them, and God wasn't merciful to them. God didn't give them repentance. Now all of a sudden you got these people who followed those, <laughs> who followed those same personalities, and God receives them. All right. Now now enters Christ, and because of Christ, the whole thing makes sense to heavenly principalities and powers. And I think it'd be very difficult for them to minister to us if they didn't know this. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now he continues, Ye who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. <clears throat> Again, Paul contrasts what we were with where we are. He already said you were dead in trespasses and sins, but God raised you. Said you're without Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, having no hope in the world, and now he's developing the other side of that. You are sometimes far off. This refers to our proximity to God. Far off. Even though he's not far from every one of us. I stated in Acts 17, 27. He, God, is not far from every one of us, but we are far from him. So someone says, how, how, how can this be? If God's a foot away from us, aren't we a foot away from God? No, God can be a foot away from you, you'd be a mile away from God. From the standpoint of God's awareness of us, not far. For the same of our awareness of God, far off. <laughs> you can see it, can't you? It's wonderful. Being lost has much to do with a lack of awareness of God. Being lost just is it that you don't do this and you do do that. Being lost is you can't, you, you grope, you're groping for God. Not persuaded that he is, that he is, and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. One of Isaiah's prophecies concerning the day of salvation is that the Lord would say, Peace, peace to him that is far off. <laughs> Even though God was not far. Now the criticality of this statement you see in the words of David, Psalm, 30, uh, Psalm 73, 27, For lo, they that are far off from thee shall perish. There it is. Said in about as succinctly as you can say it. Far off, perish. Oh, oh I'm glad God did something about us being far off. Amen. Paul referred to the Gentiles in these words, For the promises to you, a uh, Peter referred to the Gentiles in his sermon at Pentecost. The promise is to you and to your children and to all that are afar off. <laughs> Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So being far off does not refer to physical proximity. Yeah. All right, we'll take a very crude illustration <laughs> for the sake of the young. Your arm is like 33 inches long. Anything within arm's reach is 33 or less inches from you. If it's 34 inches, far off. Yeah. <laughs> right? So the point of far off is can't reach. Yeah, yeah. It's not talking about distance. Uh -huh. It's talking about can't reach. Yeah. In other words, if, so, if the one that's not far from any one of us. If he doesn't make a move toward us, mm -hmm. the people can't make a move toward him because they didn't even know which direction to move. Amen. Amen. They're far off. You that are far off. I think an illustration of this in the book of Job. 
sons of God presented themselves before God and Satan came with them. Yeah. But Satan was still far off. He was far he off. He didn't agree. Right. He didn't like <laughs> anything. Right. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. But he was there. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. See, now, the human condition, far off, particularly the Gentiles, far off. See, the God had moved toward the Jews. He, he'd, yeah. he'd moved toward them in giving the law and giving them the prophets and so forth. He made a move, but not toward the Gentiles. He didn't do that. No amount of human resolution or ingenuity or good works could make him move closer to God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. See, we could almost we could throw that in <laughs> almost every juncture. You can throw that in and kind of clarify what that is talking about. Not of works, lest any man should boast. On our own, we could not develop an awareness or cognition or sense of God. We could never be sure we were in his presence or had access to him or we were ignorant about his ways. Or, and on our own we couldn't change that. So the scripture says he made us nigh. He, he made us nigh. Amen. Other versions read New King James Version. He has brought, we have been brought near. Darby says become nigh. Made near. Geneva Bible. Brought very near to him, have come near. God made, not caused us to come near, made us near. See, yeah. I like to fast on that word. Yes, Brother Levine. The scripture says that um, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. God yeah. is one. That's Meaning right. that there was nothing we could do to meet God somehow. That's, That's right. right. But Christ had to bring us all the way. That's right. right. That's exactly Amen. it. See how that builds your confidence when you are able to identify that you've, yeah. that you've come. Yeah. This means you've been brought there. Because you already know your, you know, your frailties That's of your right. flesh. Yeah. And so That's it just right. like puts no confidence in the flesh. Amen. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you have this, he made us there. Mm -hmm. Whether, how that worked out is Jesus brought us. Yeah. Amen. That's, that's how it <laughs> Now this, he appears to contradict the exhortation of Hebrews 10.22, to draw near. Hebrews 10.22 says, let's draw near. With the two right here, it says we're made near. Right there, I think George says, draw near. All right, now here, you have to think of this in the terms of the tabernacle service. That's how you've got to think of this, because that's why that was a figure of coming near to God. See, the, the tabernacle was a picture of approaching God. Right in the tabernacle, when the Israelites camped, the tabernacle was set up and they camped around the tabernacle. And they were, in a sense, near. However, during certain times, another tabernacle was set up, they had to close the gap between them and the tabernacle. Someone brought a sacrifice, they had to bring it to the door, or that's the entrance of the outer court, they had to bring it. A One of the priests weren't dispatched to go out to one of the tents that's and right. say, we understand you have a lamb to offer all, I'm here to pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. They had to bring it. Yes. They had to come mm -hmm. near, or in this case, nearer. They already, God was not far, tabernacle, God was not far from them. When it comes to sacrifice, <laughs> they were far off. They had to draw near, come near. And for those that inside the outer court, which were the priests, before any of them could go into the tabernacle proper, they had to draw near. Yeah. They, they, were, they were far off in the outer court from where the real work was done, even though he was a few feet. They were far off. They had to come near. And even inside the tabernacle, once you're inside the tabernacle, once a year atonement was made for sin, you had to come near to the most holy place. Yeah. So here you have these different distances from the camp to the tabernacle, yeah. from the entrance of the tabernacle to the outer court, from the outer court to the tabernacle proper, from the tabernacle proper to the holy of holies. Yeah. It was all... All right, the come near is from the Holy of Holies to the Most Holy. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
when it says come near, mm -hmm. he's not talking about in the camp. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's not talking about in the outer court. He's not even, he's talking about inside the holy place where the service of God is done, drawing near, coming, is going to the most holy place. That's, that's the parallel of come near, draw near. This text is speaking of the placement, of course, that parallels our text. He made us nigh. Our text parallels the camp surrounding the tabernacle. He made them near in the sense of our text. See, made near doesn't mean from the holy place to the most holy. That distance had to be traversed by faith. See, <laughs> Jesus brings you to God. I understand that. But at some point, when you enter into his presence, at some point, you've got to make the move to, yes. to draw near. Like That's right. Even then, you won't exclude Jesus from the process. But you under, the parallels break down. Jesus, uh -huh. Types aren't complete in every way. Yeah. So it's just this distance part is what I wanted to show. We're made nigh, we're made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now, unless we think it's our own works that qualified us to come close to God, the means is still spelled out by his own blood. But it's, this text is not as simplistic as it may appear. Other versions read, through the blood, or in the blood, or through the shedding of the blood, or because of what Jesus has done for you with his blood, through the death of Christ, Christ offered his life blood as a sacrifice, and through the blood sacrifice of Christ, and the message Bible says, dying that deaths, dying that death, shedding that blood. So here, the versions present the picture that this is the blood that he shed when he died. That's not what he's talking about. This is not what he's talking about. Jesus did not, this, I understand, does not refer to Jesus dying or shedding his blood, although that was necessary. It's rather the presentation of his blood in heaven that he's talking about. Right. Jesus' blood on earth meant zero. You've really got to see this now. It wasn't until he entered in with his own blood. That's, that's where the presentation was made that caused us to come near. Amen. Oh, this is a great <laughs> truth. By his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, Having obtained eternal redemption, see, this is what that's what happened in heaven after he died and rose from the dead. <clears throat> this parallels the ministry of the high priest when he entered into the most holy and sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. Now, I suggest that the offering of the sacrifice in the fullest sense of the word was made in heaven. On earth, he offered his body. In heaven, he offered his blood. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to talk about because the thing is so profound, you kind of, you feel clumsy talking about it. But there's enough in the scriptures you can kind of figure out that this is, what it, this is what it's talking about, that the thing that moved God to change our location from out of Christ to in Christ is what the blood did in heaven. Yes. <laughs> That's what caused it to happen. So we have two different offerings, as I have said, of Christ. He offered his, of his body as a, as a sacrifice, and then the offering of his blood, which would be the parallel of the live goat and the living bird. God got the live goat and the living bird. <laughs> That's a great truth, isn't it? <laughs> I'll work on being more a little more clear about it, but it blesses my soul. For <clears throat> he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, the particular aspect of our lostness as Gentiles that he's addressing here is our lack of identity with the chosen people. 
That's the point he's addressing here now. The Commonwealth of Israel. <clears throat> we were aliens from the Commonwealth of Israel. All the privileges, all of them, had been vouchsafed to them. All of the promises, all the glory, all the covenants was given to them. So if you want to get in on that, there's got to be some way to be joined to them. Before the Gentiles could be saved, the separation between them and the Jews had to be resolved. For all the divine commitments were made to Israel, particularly those regarding Messiah, Deliverer, Savior. If we're to participate in those promises that weren't spoken to Gentiles, then there has to be some means established so that we can be joined to them and participate in those promises. That's where this comes in. He is our peace. Not talking about peace with God. Although, although we do have peace with God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. But that's not the peace he's talking about here. He's talking about peace between Jew and Gentile. That's, right. that's what he's talking about. Which is referred to as a great mystery uh -huh. in the book of Colossians. A Jew and Gentile should be joined together when they're still... They're still an unfathomable number of Christian preachers and teachers that don't accept this at all. They believe the Jews were cut off and the Gentiles took their place. But this teaching of this verse, does it, it contradicts that. He is our peace. Who hath made both, both what? Not sinner and God, that's not what he's talking about. Both Jew and Gentile, one. So God has, through Christ Jesus and the presentation of blood of heaven, rectified this situation where all the good things were promised to Israel, not to the Gentiles, and yet the Gentiles are going to be able to participate in those promises. So how is this going to be facilitated? How is it going to be brought to completion? God's going to join the Jew and the Gentile into one body. Now the Gentiles can be blessed by the prophet that was promised to Israel yeah. by Moses. They can have their hearts circumcised like it was promised to Israel. They can have a new heart and a new spirit to be delivered. They can experience intercession and God being satisfied with Christ's sacrifice for them. They can enjoy those things. Not by the promises being extended to the Gentiles, but by the Gentiles merged with the yeah. Jews. Yeah. Now the promised son of righteousness can rise upon them. See, all these promises were made to the Jews. That, that should be crystal clear to everybody. There were promises, numerous promises of the Gentiles being accepted by the prophets, but almost all of them involved the Gentiles coming to the Jews. Well, coming to the Jews ended up to be joined. <laughs> We're talking about the believing Jews, you understand. So, these were, there, there was never another Savior promised for the Gentiles. There's only one Savior promised, one new covenant promised, one branch of righteousness promised, one son of righteousness promised. It was promised to the Jews. Who could have dreamed that God would do something like this? Yeah. He found a way. Where it had to be through Christ. Christ is our peace. Which these two nations are not hostile toward each other anymore in Christ. Yeah. The situation is resolved by making the Jews and Gentiles one. Both made one. Some other versions say he united Jews and Gentiles into one people. All right, this is, that, that is what happened. All right. This means that from heaven's perspective, there's three distinct bodies of people in the earth. Before Christ, there was Jew and Gentile. That was it. Two. Now there's three. And Paul mentions him in 1 Corinthians 10.32 when he talked about not giving offense to anybody. He said, give none offense neither to the Jews, that's the unbelieving Jews, or the Gentiles, or the church of God. 
three groups. <laughs> The Jews who aren't in Christ, they're a separate entity. The Gentiles who aren't in Christ, they're a separate entity. But the church of God joined. Yeah. Jew and Gentile have been joined because of Christ. He's, and they're peaceful. They're not having cultural wars. They're one mind, one spirit. All the things that happen in the body of Christ, Jew, Gentile. This is the only real fleshly distinction God ever sanctioned. In fact, he made it. He separated the Jews from the Gentiles. It's the only valid fleshly distinction. And God has resolved it. Now this allowed him to have the Jews separate. This allowed him to develop a nation and preserve it by means of a remnant. See, the nation as a whole went astray, but there's a remnant, a nucleus of people in it that preserve the nation so Christ could come forth from that nation and be born into an environment where God would work that had been prepared for a godly, godly people. How did he do this? He broke down the middle wall of partition that was between them. He, he put it there. He broke it down. Middle wall of partition. That is a wall of separation or a barrier or a dividing wall. The dividing wall of hostility. He tore it down. Now our next lesson, we're going to identify this wall yeah. particularly. In construction, a lot of times you'll build a wall <laughs> to separate the construction from 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 the where the people are, or where the work is happening, yeah. because you can't get anything done if they're while yeah. you're working. You can't get anything done if you don't have that wall. And and so you know when they're done, when you're done. When you got the work completed, then you tear the wall down, yeah. and so that it can it can be appreciated. That's right. And that's what in, in Christ. Yeah, <laughs> I like this thought that He didn't extend the promise; He brought the other people into that's it. That's right. Because see, that's what it's what it calls a contradiction, and it would, shouldn't surprise us that God would choose to do something yeah. that is impossible and that only He could do. See, otherwise, He would have either had to hold in advance speaking the promises or he'd have to say Jew and Gentile which would have compounded the whole thing yeah, sure. yes the, the old covenant was in order to the new covenant mm -hmm. yeah. the new covenant actually fulfilled and, and brought to fruition all the things that were foretold the, the good things the, the promise came with Christ he, I mean, he actually, mm -hmm. um, he, he did the things that were held out to those under the old yeah. covenant, what mm -hmm. would happen. <clears throat> and the separation between Jew and Gentile was really established on the fact that the Jews were a covenanted people, mm -hmm. and the Gentiles were not. That's right. They were without God mm -hmm. in the world. They weren't in covenant with God. They didn't have the promises of God offered to them. It was to the Jews. And Christ himself, being a Jew, established that this covenant is not separated from the Jews and what he, he had prepared in them. But a Jew is not one that is a Jew outwardly. Yeah. And circumcision is not that in the flesh, but that in the heart of the heart. So this is what the new covenant brought in so that everyone who is in covenant with God, in Christ Jesus, yeah. then there is no division between yeah. them. Amen. But it, it still is identified with what God did in the Jews. Yeah. He established Amen. it in the Jews. He, he defined it within the Jews. And those that believe, it, it says that, that we are of them. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly, yeah. mm -hmm. and he's opened it up. He hasn't, he hasn't violated that, but the covenant is no longer valid for justification. That's right. If it's the old covenant, whether you're trying to do it as a Gentile by keeping a list of rules, or whether you're by uh, a natural-born Jew of trying to, to keep all the rules, it is in Christ. That's where... The, the covenant has been established and is mm -hmm. effectual to See, actually deliver the promise. Now that now that this has taken place, has been preached, 
it seems fairly clear to those who have working knowledge of Scripture, but this was not at all clear to the Jews. Yeah. They read the same promises, read the same words, and they concluded they were superior, and they despised the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. They looked down on them as the uncircumcision. Or they're not a New Testament church. You know, so that's how they say it today. They looked down on them when, <laughs> when actually they were going to be joined together with them. And all the benefits that were promised to them, particularly, would flow over to the Gentiles by, by virtue of their connection, not with Moses, but with Abraham. See, it goes back further than the law. We're children of Abraham by faith. It's, that's how particular God is. He didn't make the link at the, at the covenant level that was made, the old covenant, he made it with the promise that was made to Abraham. And all the promises are gay and amen that's right. in Christ. The law was added because of sin. Until the, the law was added because of sin. Yeah, that's the right. Come to whom the promises have been made. The first covenant was actually the promise that was given to Abraham. <laughs> that's right. All right, any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Yes, yeah, Sister Tasha. Um, the first point that you were making um, concerning being in Christ Jesus, um, I was reminded of what Jesus said to Saul on the road to Damascus. Because it, it always, I never really understood why he said what he said. But in light of what you yeah. were speaking of, it makes sense when he says, Why persecutest thou me? me? That's right. He didn't ask, Why are you persecuting my brethren? Or That's why right. are you persecuting mm -hmm. the right. church? Mm -hmm. It was, Why are you persecuting in me? Mm -hmm. Because Christ was in them and they were in Christ. That's right. Yeah. Amen. 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 It was his body. That's right. <laughs> do it unto the least of these, my brother. Mm -hmm. Down under me. And as I say, next lesson we'll deal with that wall because it's there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about it, particularly in the movement with which I was identified. There's major splits about this, <coughs> how you interpret worship and praise and all kind of things. So it'd be good to know that the, the, the one wall God erected has been taken down. Amen. So there's no further need or justification for division among the people. No more. And woe to him who erects the other wall. That's right. Well, and some have been erected, as we know. <laughs> See, that wall of separation was intended only while God was working on the preparatory phase of redemption. Yeah. It's also the ushering in of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, this and some Jews saw it. This is, we found him. <laughs> yeah, so this, we, this high priest God set up this high priest that, that he ever liveth to make intercession right. for the saints so the, his, his primary work in, in glory right now is bringing the sons home right. but in other words being made nigh by the blood of Christ right. by his efforts by his, by his labors we're being brought close to God Amen. Amen. that's Amen. a very compelling thought so it's a shorter distance when you're when we're caught up to be with the Lord forever, it'll be a shorter distance. <laughs> well, it'll be a distance that can't be negotiated. Maybe we put it, put it that way. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer.